Hello, and welcome to episode number 184 of the Board Game Barrage podcast, a podcast about board games, the latest hotness, and how to have fun with your friends, even when you're losing. I am Kellen, the Red Tank, joined today by Neelan, the Orange Tank, and Mark, the Green Tank. Hello. Hey. You guys are pros at this point, right? I didn't even have to say, like, say hello. No. Nope. How are you doing? You guys just know to jump in and uh, fill in the cracks. Years of work. Years of having conversations. That's right. <laughs> and then now this is when you guys go, and, and you're the best of the hosts. You know, I'm always at ease when you host an episode, Kellen. today on the board game barrage podcast we are going to be talking about science-based fiction games but wait kellen are they hard sci-fi or soft sci-fi oh we'll get to that neelan oh you bet we will we are bringing back a fan favorite bg bob segment where we are going to be arguing about the 15 best Science-based fiction board games. That doesn't mean the best 15 board games that feature science fiction, but what it means is games that feel like sci-fi, that evoke everything you love about the hardest of the hard science fiction. <clears throat> but before we do that, we'll talk about the board games that we have played. We will start with Neelan who will take us on a riverboat. And if I knew where riverboats came from, I would have... Put a place to those riverboats. And then I will cover an upcoming Kickstarter that launches on this upcoming Tuesday, Bug Councils of Backyardia. Back and Mark right will now. take us to space. We'll open the door to our feature discussion and also close the door on last week's discussion with a new science-based fiction game from one Mr. Martin Wallace, Rocket Man. That was a beautiful combination. Close one chapter, open the next. Beautiful. This is the thing, guys. I keep saying science-based fiction, and I keep hoping one of you will stop me, you know, because I don't know. Does anyone say it like that? I, I don't think anyone it. says science-based fiction. No, no one well, does, and no one ever has. I think I get why, though. Why they don't? Because I can tell you why they don't. Because No, no, no. Why, I, I think I get why you're saying science-based. Like, this is kind of like the, is Star Wars sci-fi argument? Is that where this is going? No. Oh, uh, okay. Well, so I was saying there's sort of like the soft sci-fi as in the, you know, with the Ys in it. So the SFY yeah. sci-fi SIFI network. And then there's the hard science. No, when I think of science fiction, and we can cut any and all of this as we <laughs> probably should, everyone just says science fiction, right? But that doesn't really, to me, there is like, it is fiction that is based on science. Okay. Science-based fiction. Or for short, science fiction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but do those two words work together? It is interesting, because like, I don't think I've ever questioned that they do work together, but wow. now that you say it out loud... And this is why you put me on the podcast uh -huh. all those years ago. To ask all the hard questions. <laughs> Heavy hitting. <laughs> Journalism, one could say. Right. Neelan, why don't you jump in and, well or stay on the riverboat and tell us all about this delightful Euro adventure. So Riverboat is a game by Michael Kiesling. I was encouraged to play this after Mark spoke about it a few episodes back, talking about some of the games he liked by Michael Kiesling, and Riverboat came up. So at a recent game night, I sort of took the opportunity to get, try it out because I, I'm a huge fan of a lot of Kiesling's designs as well. And I was very, very happy with it. I think this is a shockingly pleasant inventive little game one of the things that put me off playing it for a while was that it has the most generic clemens franz euro artwork on it that really does nothing to suggest anything about the game at all mechanically in a way that just actually put me off i don't know if anyone else is as put up by clemens franz art as i am but anyway regardless riverboat's pretty good the gist of riverboat is that it is a game that breaks down into like five Phases. And it's worth talking very briefly about each of these five phases because they feed into as each other. Long, as long as it's very riverboat focused, right? This game. Yeah, I, I will. Right? I'll be tying us to the theme at all possible okay. opportunities, gotcha. Mark. Don't you worry. 
the first phase of the game, and everyone does all these phases every round, is you're kind of doing a bingo style thing. So you have this hex based board and it's divided into five regions and then someone flips a card and it's like, okay, diamonds. And then everyone has to put a marker down into one of their diamond hexes. But everyone's board's a little bit different. Then spades gets called. You put a marker on the spades thing. So you're trying to create little clusters of people together on your board based on the bingo cards that come up. That's phase one. Are you, are you building the riverboat out of diamonds and spades? These are just... I'm going to say farmers. We haven't gone to the riverboat connection yet. That's coming. There'll be plenty of riverboats. Oh, yeah. The, rivers the, and boats. The, the, the riverboat rapids. theme, the, this is all building towards yeah. this big, beautiful theme. <laughs> so Phase the farmers two, first have bingo night. Fa- yeah, farmers play bingo and they form little plots on their farm. Phase, Phase one. two, they plot vegetables, Kellen. Everyone knows okay. this. So using your little arrangements of farmers, so if I had like a little cluster of three of them together, I could say, okay, I'm going to get one of these triple vegetable tiles and replace the farmers with those vegetables that's great everyone does that then the all-important phase three the riverboat phase and this oh. is where the theme suddenly comes to light and you're drafting riverboat tiles you put them in your board for rewards that's the riverboat phase <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that is going to be based on like how many of specific vegetables you had of a certain type. So if I had four carrots and I could trade all of them in to get a riverboat of strength four. So you take diamonds and spades, uh-huh. which help you grow vegetables uh-huh. that you then barter with to buy riverboats. I think that's potentially it. Yes, you're, you're bartering for riverboats or passage on the riverboats. Unclear. In phase four, you're drafting scoring cards, which is going to allow you to score any number of different things, you know, based on whether you've placed your farmers in a specific arrangement, whether you have a certain number of riverboats, whether you have certain things on your board. And then number five, everyone scores these things simultaneously. But you only have a certain number of scoring markers, and you have to get more over the course of the game. And that's kind of the basic flow of the game. The one thing that I haven't said is that everyone is drafting each of these phases. So they kind of race for the galaxy style. They get a little bit of a bonus if they are the one that drafts that phase. But unlike race for the galaxy, every phase executes every round. So it's just about the bonus that you're picking for that specific phase and that's kind of the gist of it so you choose the phase that you want to get the most benefit of everyone sort of executes those phases in that flow and it's just got this pleasant loop to it i really had a good time going through this you play four rounds of it and the way that each system leads into the next along this sort of process and then feeds back into even the first one is is just really really smartly designed and was just really really pleasant to interact with i do wish that this had anything more interesting going on with it in terms of theme but like a lot of keysling designs it was just a solid fun little game i would recommend it yeah i really enjoy it i think the like face selection is pretty interesting because not only do you get a bonus you also go first in the phase right correct yeah which is huge yeah which can be very huge because it's a game where a lot of the most important resources can go quickly and you're fighting for position in a lot of different tracks but yeah the fact that they call this riverboat is almost (laughs) criminal because really it's such a tacked on aspect of the game that uh, it's much more accurate to call it like farmers right it seems like it almost would make more sense if it just had a random german town as the right name. yes exactly right but you did lead to an interesting point mark which is it's actually it is more interactive than i think maybe some of the descriptions of generic euro would have you believe because you are fighting over very specific things and trying to find the right phase to go all in on to say like okay, this is the one i need yeah. to go first on so that i get this before kellen is what the game is. There's even like an area control aspect to one portion of the game. So there's a fair bit of fun little interaction. A lot of moments where I was like killing myself over the fact that I didn't pick a particular phase first or that someone got to a card before I did. So it packs a lot of that into a fairly medium weight package. Yeah, the interaction is indirect. You're not ever like yes. invading anybody's spot or destroying anything that anybody else has built, but it is ever present. There is a lot of it. I feel like this is like the thing that we have become the most jaded about as professional board game podcasters, which is like the game that you go in going, I'm not going to like this. And then about halfway through, you're like, wow, like goody, (laughs) this is fun. You know, like I feel like we understand what games are likely going to deliver having just experienced like reading the rules, but like listening to you talk about it, like, I'm excited to try it now in spite of everything else that I'm looking at here (laughs) on BGG. Yeah, it's a decent length, 90 minutes, but didn't feel like it overstayed its welcome. Had a great time with it. That is Riverboat by Mayfair Games.
All right, we are going to talk about a game that is launching on Kickstarter on Tuesday, August the 3rd. So if you listen to this when it comes out, right when it comes out, you will only be able to get to the preview link, which we will include in the show notes. But if you listen to it after Tuesday the 3rd, you can check out a live Kickstarter page. We're always trying to figure out the perfect time to cover a Kickstarter game, whether we do that after it's already launched. But in reality, you kind of need to do it before it launches so that you can help build its hype. So a preview copy of Bug Council of Backyardia was given to us, but that it featured pre-production artwork and components. Uh, and we all got a chance a few weeks back to play this. It is a trick-taking Moncala game. Everyone remembers playing Moncala as a second grader and having never played it again since the second grade. No. Moncala, for those who don't know, is everyone familiar with Moncala? Probably. I would say most people. Everyone? This. Possibly. Everyone. I'll say everyone. They all know? Isn't this one know. of those games that used to have like a Windows app version? Like include- I think so. Maybe I'm misremembering. Get off the computer, baby Neelan. <laughs> For those who don't know, Moncala is a system where you have essentially a circle and you pick up all the cubes on one square in that circle and then you distribute them by dropping them one in a line as you keep going around the circle, redistributing the resources. So Bug Council of Backyardia, which is a hilarious name, essentially is a trick-taking game where the Trump suit changes over the course of the round because the player who plays the lowest card in each hand they lose the hand but they get to influence the moncala and change which faction may be the most powerful it is as simple as it sounds which is amazing the first game that came to mind that that is similar to this is one of oink's best which is mask men where you are playing a trick taker type game, but you're unsure of which suit is more powerful than the other suit, and things change as the round goes. This also has the ability for you to try to shoot the moon, which if you're not super familiar with trick taking, means you can declare no allegiance to the factions, and if you win no tricks, score a bunch of points. And then the last thing, which is one of the funnest things actually, is that you will not play the last card in your hand, because that is the bug that you have pledged allegiance to, and you will score points equal to the resources that are on that card from the Moncala minigame that you're playing. So even if you're losing dramatically in the hands, you can still make up and get quite a few points just by having the right allegiance at the end. And alliances sort of start forming where it's like, I'll bet Neilan likes blue or red, and I'll bet Mark really wants green, and he might be trying to save that for the last card in his hand. I was absolutely delighted by this for how simple and how straightforward it was. I was concerned by the artwork, but based on Board Game Geek, they have redone most of all of that artwork. You know, we don't give our hot takes on Kickstarter often, but I will say that my biggest recommendation is I will be backing the game on Tuesday. I have a pre-production copy that I could hold on to, but I'm excited about the new artwork. I like supporting indie developers, and I enjoyed this one immensely as a straightforward trick-taking game with a twist. Neelan and Mark, talk to me about Bug Council of Backyardia. I thought this was adorable. It's funny because there ended up being a art debate on the day between this and other pre-production art. But I think that, like you said, like the art in Bug Council of Backyardia even in its pre-production form, just had this very, very charming, endearing quality to it. This very sort of cartoony, where each of the different insects is like imbued with like a personality that's specific to them, and it was a delight. As for the game itself, the interplay between the scoring via the Mancala system, because by hanging onto the card at the end of the round, you're sort of banking on scoring points via the, the Mancala system, which can be manipulated by other players. There's kind of this almost like push-your-luck element of like, well... Are the ants are looking really strong now, but are they still going to be at the end of the round? And you sort of have to manipulate both systems as they interplay with each other. Like, it's, it's a pretty clever design. Yeah, and I'm a sucker for any sort of, like, card game where you're given a bunch of tough decisions to make without a whole bunch of rules. And if you've ever played a trick taker and if you're at all familiar with the Mancala system, and even you don't even need to be familiar with that. It's a pretty simple thing to be taught. You can dive right into this, and I really appreciate that. And yeah, just very much enjoyed it. There's a bunch of trick-taking variants, so it's kind of hard to stand out in that crowd, but I think Bug Council does a good job of that. Yeah, I think it also has a cool sense of escalation as you, in between rounds, you actually add points onto the Mancala, 
So in the future, there's just going to be more points on all of the squares, which kind of provides a a round-based escalation. I think this is delightful. I do love a lot of small board games that come out of Japan that are as weird as Bug Council of Backyardia. So take that for what you will. But again, you know, the biggest endorsement I can give it is that I am using my own money to purchase it, (laughs) unless I use Neelan's credit card to purchase it, which he has left here in the past. Wait, that's where that is? Yes, that is where that is, Neelan, Mr. Sherlock. And that is Bug Council of Backyardia. We'll have a link to that in the show notes, but you can find that on Kickstarter right now. If that sounds interesting, you should back it right now. And then, Mark, you could edit it so that it's, I'm saying that sentence, you know, like seven more times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, echoey, right. Like, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Like, you should back it. What's the word? Right now. Right now. No, no, no. My pitch is perfect. I thought you want different. Like, Why no, would you now, change now, my pitch? Now, now. No, it's like subliminal advertising. So okay. it's like at different points, you just interject it. Like, okay, sure. Right uh, now, you know, in, the, in and out. You see what I'm saying? Like backwards. Like rock and roll music? Like satanic verses? Well, no, because then how are they going to know that they need to back it right now? No, they're going to know. Their brain re- they, yeah, scrambles it. They, it exactly. Works. They absorb the sound and their brain reverses it in their sleep. It's like and then they're worshiping Satan. Yeah, that's right. What? <laughs> Excuse. That's what you're asking for, right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Take us to space, Mark. I was inspired by our own podcast. Can you believe that? I was inspired by a podcast that I was on. Remarkable. <laughs> by us is what I'm hearing. Yes. Not you. Not me. Not my the part us, of it. The Neilan and Kellen. The Royal Us. Yes. Our podcast last week on the great designer Martin Wallace, and I got a chance to check out one of his latest games, Rocketman. Rocketman is a space themed, some might say a sci fi themed deck builder. Might you say a science based themed? Oh, Neela, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, science based themed deck builder. <laughs> and as with most of Martin Wallace's designs, it takes a tried and true mechanism and throws a little twist in it. The twist here is mostly a push your luck mechanism. There's a lot of things that you will be familiar with from other deck building type of games. At the beginning of your turn, you draw, I believe it's six cards, and then you can use all your cards to do any number of actions. But they sort of come down to three pots of actions. One is to buy cards from the array. You're spending the money on the cards to buy stronger cards, which will either give you more money or give you rockets or give you other things to aid in your missions. That's the first thing, buy cards from the array. Second thing you can do is to set your mission plan. So there's a spot on your board to set your mission plan to fly to one of three worlds. You can fly to the Earth, the Moon, or to Mars. So you can sort of set that and say, I'm going to be going to here. I'm going to be trying to go to one of these places. And then finally, you can equip that mission by placing cards onto what's called your launch pad. So once you have a a mission set, you can now play cards instead of to buy cards from the array. You can now play them to prep the mission. The way you do that is you spend rockets. So a trip to the moon might require six rockets. A trip to Mars might require 10 rockets depending on the distance and the difficulty sort of the trip. And so you're drawing your cards, you're playing them once you have a mission set up, mostly to set up that mission. So you're mostly playing rocket cards to the launch pad, and then you're discarding any cards that you didn't use. You can also hang on to cards that you want. So that's a common twist on deck building where, you, where you're not forced to discard if you don't want to. But you discard down as many cards as you want, and then you draw back up to six, and you go on and on. At the end of any turn, you can declare that you're launching. You're going for it. And the way that works is the first thing you do is you look at your launch pad. There are some cards that give you a bonus that sort of start you on your way. For example, if you're going to the moon, there's an icon that will, for every icon you have of that, will push you along the path to the moon. And then, depending on where you're going to, you draw cards from this other stack of cards that are numbered from zero to four. And depending on how far you go, you're flipping a number of cards. So it takes, for example, 10 spaces to go to the moon. When you go to the moon, you flip four cards. So the first card might be a two. So you move two up the track and you flip another card, you flip another card. And then at some point you can decide to abort the mission. Like if you don't think you're going to be able to make it, you can say you're going to abort the mission, which forces you to lose some of your cards on your launch pad, but you can launch the mission again, or you can go for it. And then that means drawing another card. And if you get to wherever your destination is, you'll score points and potentially power up your tableau. Or if you fail, if you draw all the cards that are required to go on the mission and you don't get to the destination, 
your mission sort of blows up. You get nothing. For all the work you've done, you get nothing. And I think that is a source of discontent for people who have played it. I've seen some reviews have qualms with that, have qualms to push your luck. And I, I get that because there's a semi-big investment and you can crash out. I didn't find that so problematic. There were a couple times in our game where the last draw of the card could have meant success or failure, but underneath where the stack of cards is kept, you can see the distribution of cards, so you know there are three zeros, there's one four, so you have an idea, and then there's further ways to mitigate it by getting equipment, like there's equipment that will let you discard any card that comes up in that draw, so you know you have some level of protection. And also, it led to a lot of like very exciting moments when we had that last card draw. I will say there were the exciting moments, but nobody in our game, I think maybe one time uh, somebody failed, but it felt like you could mitigate it. It was not like a complete luck fest, which is what I sort of feared going into it. It also moves super, super quickly, which I always love from a deck builder. It's a thing where you take your turn, the other person takes their turn, and you're basically already to finish your turn by the time it comes back to you. There were a lot of times where I was taking an action, yeah. or my opponent was taking an action, and while they were taking their action, I was pretty much ready to go, ready to finish up my next action. So it moves super, super quickly. We got done with a game in under an hour. So yeah, not my favorite Wallace by any stretch, but a lot of interesting things. If I wanted to play a deck builder, this would definitely won't be one I would consider just because it's unique with that push your luck system and it moves super, super fast. Did you make it to Mars in your game? I made it to Mars. I made it to Mars, Earth, and the Moon. I pulled the trifecta. Great. Now you're the biggest idiot on two planets. <laughs> in the moon. So that is Rocket Men by Martin Wallace. Here in the interlude, we did want to feature a review of the Board Game Barrage podcast. One of the best things that you can do for the show is leave a nice review uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. The easiest way to do that is on Apple Podcasts, but there are other ways to do it as well. This review comes to us from GT4785. What a good username. And this review is titled Just the Best with five out of five stars. BGB is truly the funniest and most engaging podcast I've ever listened to in my life. They assemble, they assimilate, they trudge, but don't judge. They bask, they bosk, they cram and slam, they banter. They are excellent. Maybe that boating cruise story from episode 74 made me very sad, and I hope everything is okay. I'm a social worker and would love to help. Great <laughs> podcast, exclamation mark. Wow, this review had everything. Yeah. Right? It had the mid-turn there where you got a little worried. But thank you. I just took a family vacation, so the family is still together. Though we did borrow Mark's copy of True Colors and A Question of Scruples. Oh, yeah. To try to break things up, and, and we'll maybe get to that in a future episode, but that episode is not today. But once again, if you're able to leave a review for the podcast, that does help us so much. And it warms our heart to read positive reviews. So uh, thank you so much for everyone who's written in. And thank you, GT4785, for your review and your concern. <laughs> uh, my family is intact. Now on to our featured topic today, which is the return of BG Bob, where we will give you the 15 best science-based fiction board games, otherwise known as sci-fi. We would usually spend this time to talk about what we mean when we say sci-fi, but if you don't know what we mean when we say sci-fi, you can go ahead and Google that or find it in the BGB dictionary, I hope. So let us get on to it. We use the Pub Meeple ranking engine, which allows us to argue. We have each brought five games to the fight, five dogs to the show, five ponies to the race. And we will argue for them, and we will come up with a definitive list at the end that you can use if you're interested in pursuing some science fiction board games. Without further ado... Well, one thing. Well, What's the big rule? Oh, is there... We have rules? Your vote is not locked in until you use the phrase, fire away. And when you say fire away, your vote's locked in. How come you never say the slogan, <laughs> and yet I agree to all your stupid <laughs> rules? You didn't agree to that. You were very... <laughs> Grudging All right, yes. Your your vote is locked in when you say fire away. When you have two out of three, we move on, and you need to stop talking if you're not in that majority. Without further ado, our first fight is Anachrony in one corner and Eclipse in the other corner, and I'm going to hope that that's second dawn for a new galaxy eclipse. But Anachrony being championed by Mark. 
Posada, the green yes. tank, and Eclipse by Neelan, the orange tank. Why don't you, Neelan, introduce us to Eclipse? Yeah, so if you would think about sci-fi as classic, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, spaceships flying across space with technology, shooting lasers at each other, and settling planets throughout the galaxy, Eclipse is the game that captures all of that. It is one of the most 4X games that exists. You're expanding, you're exploiting, you're exterminating, and you're... Explore? Did I say explore? Exploring! (laughs) And these are all very all core tenets of space sci-fi, and it captures all of that. You have a fleet of starships, and one of the coolest things about Eclipse is that you can upgrade your starships in ways that are unique to you. So everyone has a small class, a medium class, a large class, but my one might have missiles, Kellen's might have better engines, Mark's one might have armor... So when they interact with each other in these big battles where you're throwing a ton of dice, the way that they play out is going to depend on how you've teched them up and how you've built them and how you've deployed them. It's a very cool, expansive game that sort of captures everything about that big fleets and space battles that you would want. Anachrony is a worker placement game about traveling through time. You're breaking the space-time continuum to save your dying planet. There's been a cataclysm, and you can ask your future self to send back resources that you'll need today to get things done. If you play this game with the exosuit edition, which I would highly recommend, you have these incredible little exosuits that you put your chits in. And come on, it's time travel. What more can you ask for? Mark, isn't the time travel just a glorified loan system? Neilan, how can you have a exciting sci-fi game that is a Euro game? Wait, isn't Anachrony a Euro game? I mean... There's robots in it, Neilan? Yeah, does it have ro- robot suits? Come on, Neilan's game is a spreadsheet game. Come on, Callan. Okay, okay, I am a impartial witness, having never tried Anachrony or Eclipse, and eagerly wanting to try both of them. And I was shocked when I saw Anachrony in Mark's list, because I thought this game was about magicians. <laughs> So come to find out it's about time travel and exoskeletons. Okay, Eclipse. I was with Neilan until he said missiles, um, and then I didn't know what the f*** he was talking about. Um, It's a space technical term, Kellen. Like, the pronunciation is all over the place. This is a hard one, because time travel really leans into the things I like about science fiction. But I do think that Neilan has a strong argument that Eclipse is sort of like, it encapsulates it all. There are 5,000 games that do that. 4X, okay. the whole category of games. There's a million 4X yeah. games. How many time travel yeah. games are there? But how many of them do it with spaceships? There is that time travel game with <laughs> anime. Does your time travel game have anime? I mean, sure. Wait, you can't you just say like, sure and make it if so. If you squint, this sort of looks anime. No, they I don't. I have been persuaded by Mark Posada only because the argument that the most stereotypical sci-fi game that you could have brought to this fight, Neilan, was Eclipse anachrony fire away i'm actually not that mad about this anachrony was on my submission list as well uh it's a fantastic game i will accept its victory all right Uh uh-oh we've got a double dose of kellen so if you don't even like a single dose of kellen (laughs) well you better turn off right now we got a double dose in one corner we have quantum in the other corner we have forbidden stars quantum is a great length sci-fi game where every die that you have represents a spaceship and there are six different types of spaceships one for each side of the dice and as you move around and as you fight each one can do different things where they can help transport other ships or they're really nimble and and good at fighting or they're really slow and have strong missiles it is a very deterministic feeling system that feels pseudo chess like and on its own it has this sort of stark blackboard space, really cool translucent dice that really do feel like a science fiction game. And then, and then you add technologies. I think one of the best things about science fiction is the limitless potential. And Quantum has that in spades, where each game, new cards are going to come out, and you're like, oh my god, now you can do that. And so for me, one of the appeals of science fiction is established really, really well in Quantum. I think Quantum is a great science fiction board game. In the other corner, we have Forbidden Stars. Now, this is a granddaddy of a board game. We have not spent much time covering Forbidden Stars. Have either of you played Forbidden Stars? Yeah, I've played it once as a two-player. I really, really liked it, but God, it's long. Yes. Well, okay, but science fiction is long. 
Have you seen 2001 A Space Odyssey? Uh, Forbidden Stars, here's the problem, right? I'm supposed to describe why this is a good sci-fi game, and it is a good sci-fi game because it's very long. There are huge space quadrants. There are multiple different factions fighting, but these factions are Warhammer 40K, and I don't know what the first part of that sentence means, and I don't know what the second part of that sentence means, but I can tell you that in this game, you are doing a lot of things that feel... Sciency, you are teleporting around the board, you are trying to establish dominion over planets, you have special powers, you have these races that feel really impactful. This is, in many ways, a game like Twilight Imperium or like Eclipse, but it skews much, much more into that thematic crowd. I know that there will be Forbidden Stars stands who say, wow, Kellen, you just butchered that description, but I do think Forbidden Stars is a fantastic sci-fi game. I do believe they are working on a reworking of this without the license, and that will definitely be one to watch. It also features really strong deck building where you're using different technology and powers in your battles. But yes, my God, this game is long. I do find myself in the weird position where I feel like I'm not the one that's throwing my lot behind the 40K game because Forbidden Stars was actually close to being one of the ones I did submit. It is incredible, but I really just can't get past the fact you know, that I had it played it, got rid of it, because it is just such an awkward thing to try to get to the table. It, it's super long. But that's not to say that it's any less science fiction-y. I, I struggle with the fact that I didn't get a 40k game onto this list. But I'm going to say Quantum Fire Away, because Quantum is an excellent little, it's felt like dice tactical game that has, like, like you said, elements of chess to it. It's great. And the way that the game varies with the cards that come out is really, really cool. Yeah, for me, I haven't played Forbidden Stars, so I speak from some level of ignorance, but Forbidden Stars feels to me a little bit like a war game more than sci-fi. Like, I don't I don't necessarily feel the sci-fi coming out, but again, that could be because I hadn't played it. So I'm going to go with Quantum Fire Away, because if you're talking sci-fi, 4X is a great sci-fi type of game, so gotta go 4X. All right. Right, Neil? Yeah, you're, I, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> we gotta move along. And we are moving along to Mark in one corner, me in the other corner. Mark presents Beyond the Sun. And Kellen presents Imperial 2030. Okay, you know what sci-fi is all about? Sci. You know what sci stands for? Science. You know what science does? Technology. You know what Beyond the Sun has? Tech trees. It's all about tech trees. Technology equals science. Beyond the Sun is tech trees, the board game. There are a number of different paths that you can take to tech up your colony, and you are traveling down them. You can see the different permutations of the techs you can pick up. If you like the tech tree aspects of like civilization type games, Beyond the Sun is all about that, and it's all about space, and it's all about technology, Beyond the Sun. Okay, should I argue against Beyond the Sun now, or talk about Imperial 2030? A little this, a little that. Well, that's hard. I don't know that my brain does that. Well, I think you should talk about Imperial 2030 first, which was a remake of Imperial, which was not... Oh, no, no, no. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> no, go what? ahead. No, sorry. You can't speak right now. Oh, no, sorry. Imperial 2030 is one of the best board games of all time, not to mention it is set more than, well, not more than 10 years in the future. I guess depending on when we recorded uh-huh. this, more than yeah. 10 years in the future. Nothing says <laughs> science like nine years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the up (laughs) neil imperial 2030 is a game about world powers negotiating but those world powers care more about money than they do anything else and so you take control of factions in a game that sometimes feels a little like risk except you don't actually care about the countries you control and you're actually just trying to take the money from them i think that imperial 2030 works much better than Imperial because of how cynical it is. This is the most cynical board game of all time. And I do think that some of the best science fiction plays in this space. It's not about making Star Wars for the 15th time. It's about... (laughs) It's about speculative cynicism and a natural extension of what the world could feel like. And so for me, Imperial 2030 represented something I didn't see anywhere else on this list. I think another great game that could fit in here, but doesn't fit in here, but I want to fit it in here so that you give me more votes is New Angeles that has a similar sort of vibe, which is that 
these corporations are not your friends, that money is all that matters, and even your country lines don't tie you together. And I do believe that that is an important element of science-based fiction. Hence, you should vote for Imperial 2030. I'm actually really with you, Callan. Like, I, I think that the premise of Imperial 2030 is something that could be like an Outer Limits or like a Black Mirror episode, you know? Like the idea that all these countries are just effectively corporate-owned and like there are these proxy wars playing out. Like, it is an interesting sci-fi Very concept. Astute. Neilan. Okay. Oh my god. Very astute. <laughs> don't just don't fire away. You can say whatever you want. Neilan. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. No, I, I, go away. Go for it, Mark. Okay. No, go ahead. You can finish. Uh, no, no, that, that's it. That's the end of that thought. Okay. I think Imperial 2030 is probably the better game. But science fiction? You've got boats and you've got like tanks in this game, and it's set nine years from today. What are we talking about? There's no science fiction in this game. This is a ridiculous argument. It's the better game. It is not the better science fiction game. 2030? Come on. This is this is the stuff future? happening today. I mean, where's the science fiction? Come on. Right. This is a ridiculous argument. Well, I'll save my big guns for Beyond the Sun when I need them. I don't think I need them right now. Imperial 2030. Fire away. Beyond I'm so torn. Away. I'm torn because like, I think you're absolutely right that there's nothing that says like science more than like tech and the tech tree and a game built around that like if anything the core mechanic in beyond the sun is science yeah versus the tech of boats <laughs> what are we uh, talking no, no, no. about here i think i'm with you mark i love the argument for imperial 2030 but i think beyond the sun fire away clinches it for me well that was a mistake i can't believe it was even that close honestly all right we have two games. Neelan brings us Sol, Last Days of a Star, and Mark brings us Space Alert. Sol, Last Days of a Star. I've mentioned this whenever I've spoken about this game, but this is so evocative of the sort of sci-fi movies and films that I love. You can imagine this playing out in like the most cinematic way. It's almost like you can picture the visuals of something like a sunshine. Well, you could almost imagine them because they just stole it like wholesale directly from it. But I mean, carry on. The sun dying, like the one thing, like let's not go crazy here. That's a trope. But yeah, you can see the grand story of this playing out in like a bigger epic form. Like it's, even though the game is kind of just mechanically weird, it has these cool cool ideas like your space station is orbiting the sun and you have to time your actions as to when it's going to be in various positions of orbit it has sciencey mechanics to it while invoking like a big sci-fi film this is actually really tough because i think soul is a great fit for this category space alert i like because it goofs on the science fiction star trek sort of trope where you know you're on a ship and you're trying to deal with an invading army or something malfunctioning and for those who are not familiar with the game it is a real-time cooperative literally all hands on deck game where things are coming at you there's a timer and you're trying to run around the ship and fix things and deal with aliens that are attacking and do all these things that are very evocative like the sci-fi television show tropes that you're familiar with and it's just great fun it's a game that's been out for a long time but really holds up but this is a tough call for me. This is a tough, tough call. I didn't hear anything that couldn't have happened in the year 2030, Mark, in your description. Uh, aliens attacking? What do, you what do you mean? They're already among us. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hard call. I mean, I'm going to go with Space Alert because I brought it. I danced with the, with the one I brought. But it's tough. It could go either way. Mark Alert, doesn't even have conviction behind his choice, Kellen. You like the movie I Sunshine. I said that specifically I'd to get your vote. Yeah, but they stole, stole it. They did steal it's it. It's the same with the new Dune poster. They also stole it, and so did Interstellar. Now, who can say if Sunshine stole it from 2001 A Space Odyssey? I've never seen it, so I can't say. Mark, okay, this is what I need from yeah. you, okay? Real time, I've not played Space Alert. I know there's a soundtrack, right? Yes. So why don't you just pretend like there's 30 seconds left in the round and like start screaming at me, and then based on your performance, I'll judge if it's sci-fi enough. Whee! Aliens attack. Aliens attack. What? Oh. Wee, wee. Go to sector this B. Is, sector B. This is <laughs> This is what you do with the yeah, game? Yeah, pretty much. All right, space alert. <laughs> fire away. Boom. All right, this is me on the left, Mark on the right. I am bringing us Dune, the board game, and Mark is bringing us Nemesis. I love this. So Dune, it's hard to ignore the IP when you talk about science fiction 
board games. And the Dune board game is one of the best board games that has ever been created. The Dune board game has also been brought back as recently as 2019 with Gale Force 9 releasing a new edition of the game that is very inexpensive to own. Dune is the master of science fiction. Dune, the novel, right? Just to be clear. What Mar- Mark is making faces? I, I don't know if that's a cut and dried statement you can make there. So much of our science fiction based tropes <laughs> that we have today are cribbed from Dune. Star Wars owes a tremendous amount to Dune. And Dune, the board game, is a asymmetric fight to the death where the interlocking systems really work. This is the space opera, perhaps my favorite genre of science fiction where everything is larger than life. It's more pretentious than pretentious can be. Have you seen the new Dune trailer? I have, as well as the first 10 minutes of the film, because I drove to a theater two hours away to watch the first 10 minutes of the film before it comes out, because I'm a dummy. I really, Mark, am excited to hear your knockoff argument for Nemesis when I've got the real deal, the genuine, the Dune from 2019, one of, if not, the best science fiction-based board game of all time. Why would you go with an old has-been IP when you could go with oh my fresh, God. fresh IP based on nothing, <laughs> Nemesis? <laughs> Made out of whole cloth. But seriously, look, Nemesis is not a, as good a game as Dune. That is my opinion. However, it is super evocative of the dark sci-fi like in a ship that is unmanned and who knows where it's going and is there an enemy among us and the big aliens and the whole thing the sense of paranoia all that for arguing best game then you would have my vote but we're arguing sci-fi game and i i would say that you know dude is sort of fantasy more than sci-fi where nemesis is hard oh, no, sci-fi you didn't. hard sci-fi it's funny because like, I think both these arguments can't help but play a little bit to my love of either IP. And as someone that vastly prefers... Well, there's no IP. <laughs> to, let's not Nemesis get started on that. New. But as someone who vastly prefers Dune to Alien, Mark, you should watch it if you've never what? seen it. What a film. But yeah, I, I have more love, I would say, for Dune as a property. And I do think that, the, that Dune's biggest strength is it evokes Dune like nothing else. It also is, is a good game, whereas Nemesis is a middling game it is hard mark because i do agree that nemesis does does better than most games evoke that theme completely but i mean so does dune yeah. like dune does it better than most and i think it does it better than nemesis does so i think dune right. gets my vote fire away neilan but before you before you do that let me tell you one of my favorite ways to troll board game companies in the modern time there are actually alien board games that have been licensed and are coming out in 2021 yeah. so every time i see awaken realms post about nemesis I reply, oh, I didn't know you guys were making an alien game. I bet they <laughs> and then love every that. Time these, and then every time the other companies post about making an alien game, I reply and I say, oh, I didn't know you guys were working on a nemesis Perfect. game. So does that help you at all with your vote? It, it does. If anything, it just makes me more angry at nemesis. Dune, fire away. Lock it in. All right. Neilan brings us both Sidereal Confluence and Gaia Project. I'll start it off with Gaia Project. So Gaia Project, I think, speaks to the power of theming to me a little bit because Terra Mystica is a game that I wanted to like a lot and I couldn't latch onto. So when Gaia Project comes out and it reworks a lot of the systems and gives it the sci-fi theme, the ability for that to transform that by sort of taking certain mechanical systems and lending them a sci-fi edge, like turning those cult tracks into technology tracks, and suddenly that's a whole lot more interesting and thematic and cohesive to me, speaks to a lot of how Gaia Project, through the power of its theme, really, really works for me. It's a game that is, again, about settling planets and creating like this civilization across multiple stars that you're sort of competing with other players for. Each race is like completely different and speaks to like the thematic strengths of that specific alien race i think gaia project is a great little science fiction game and terra mystic and gaia project together i think have just stood the test of time in terms of just strong competitive euro mechanics sidereal confluence on the other hand speaks to a specific avenue of sci-fi that i think is really really underrepresented in the board game space which is this idea that hey we are now a multi-species 
civilization, the multi-species federation, and we're all cooperating on some level. We're creating trade. We're creating opportunities. We're working together. We're collaborating. We all have these intense differences in our asymmetry, but we have to find a way to work with our neighbors across this multi-civilization spanning network. And I just think that that's a cool idea. That's the sort of sci-fi in the realm of like Star Trek that I've always liked, this idea of like, we have our differences, but we need to find a way to work together. And Sidereal represents that. I'm going to go with Sidereal because I think it's a inter- more interesting take on sci-fi. And I have not played Gaia Project, although I, I know I should. But the fact that it is a, not a strictly re-theme, but, you know, a take on Terra Mystica, I think knocks a point off of it in terms of the the theme, the adherence to the theme or the, or the importance of the theme. So I'm going to go Sidereal Confluence, by the way. I am not going to blow my main argument on Sidereal Confluence here because I fear it will be used against me in a future discussion point. I want to select Gaia Project because I find it in better taste than what is cooking in Sidereal Confluence, but I will go ahead and say Sidereal Confluence fire away to protect myself from a future fight. That's called strategy, folks. As I was talking about both games, I sort of just got really into the idea of like everything I was saying about Sidereal Confluence. I surprised myself <laughs> there a little bit. And like, and actually, I do think it is actually kind of a, a very neat take on that theme and that idea. One that, again, I don't see anywhere else. So I, I'm going to go with Sidereal Confluence Fire Away. All right. Mark brings us Race for the Galaxy, and Neelan brings us Android Netrunner. All right. So with Race for the Galaxy, the biggest thing about it in this argument is that I think it's probably one of the best games we've talked about. So in terms of quality of game, I think Race for the Galaxy is high up there. In terms of the theming, I will admit that you could have it themed in in other ways. You could have it themed as uh, corporations versus hackers, for example. But in this case, it's different sort of star systems that are fighting each other. (laughs) The way that I think it does sort of tie in with the theme is the fact that you are building a tableau and you can go with a sort of military system where you're just taking over cards or you can bring on board different planets and sort of use them to produce goods and increase your tableau that way. And it's also, you do have the wide variety of cards, so you do have that sort of like galaxy full of options feeling whenever you play Race for the Galaxy. There's a ton of different Ooh. cards, can do a ton of different things. That's in the rule book, right? That is in the rule book. That was, yeah. Lehman started with that and then went and built the game from that sentence. So that is Race for the Galaxy. Android Netrunner, I think, speaks to something that Kellen was talking about a little bit with Imperial 2030, which is kind of this idea that the cynicism is baked into it a little bit. Like this idea that corporations are bad, except they don't think they're bad. So in a game of Netrunner, one person is playing a corporation and one person is playing the hacker and the hackers are the enemy. You launch propaganda campaigns against them. You're trying to sort of convince the people that the hackers are trying to bring down everything you're built. You're just this innocent medical company. But meanwhile, obviously, the hackers have a completely different perspective. It's that classic sci-fi trope of where is the line between sort of anarchy and creation and netrunner sort of encompasses all this in one of the more thematic sort of card games because again this is a asymmetric card game where one player plays the hacker and they're running on the corporation servers trying to get their hidden agendas that they don't want to be made public while the corporations are icing up all their servers with firewalls to try stop the hackers from getting in it just evokes a really really cool science fiction theme that has a little bit of almost you know that sort of neuromancer social criticism baked into it while also just being colorful and evocative and like very very pleasant on the eyes oof we've got my toughest choice of the night i think that cyberpunk-esque things really really work until they fall off a cliff there's a massive cliff and then they become horrifyingly as bad as steampunk see blade runner and blade runner 2049 as being on the pinnacle here Android Netrunner works for me. The artwork is spectacular. What it feels like asymmetrically is amazing. The gameplay itself doesn't immediately make me think science fiction. The grip, all the terms I hate. On the other side with Race for the Galaxy, I think that if you want a spoiler for the end of your list, I predict a Race for the Galaxy rapid ascent into the top 50 um, for perhaps Mark and myself, as we have been really enjoying some games on Board Game Arena. 
And I do think that Race for the Galaxy, I think the iconography feels foreign in this weird sciencey way in the way that I describe sort of quantum. With that said, I can't uh, in good faith not vote for Android Netrunner here, even though I want to vote with you, Mark, Race for the Galaxy, but I vote Android Netrunner Fire Away. That was a twist. <laughs> that was a sci-fi yeah. Twilight Zone end of episode twist. Right. All right, Mark brings us an acrony, and I bring you the new game to the fight, Cosmic Encounter. How can we have a list of science fiction games? How could the two of you, why don't you just turn in your board game cards right now that neither of you had this on your list? Cosmic Encounter is the granddaddy of all negotiation games. There are hundreds of asymmetric alien powers that are all interacting and fighting in very, very stupid and very, very silly ways where each alien has a new power, a new type of technology, and a little backstory little backstory that tells you about what planet they come from and why they actually prefer to lose the battles than to win the battles. You combine that with an amazing production from Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, and we're not even, you know, being kind to them because do they even exist anymore? Who could say with what they've got going on? But these little ships are beautiful. You've got them in a bunch of different colors. If you get a new version, <laughs> they're translucent. They're translucent. And what says science fiction more than translucent. I like that argument. I actually like that argument. That said, Neilan, you had this on your list. I had this on my list. Let's just do Yeah, it. I, I think the thing I will say in the Nakanese corner, though, Callan, is that like Mind Clash does this thing where they wrap theme and mechanics so closely together that Anachrony is, I think, such a perfect marriage of theme and mechanics. And look, I like... Cosmic I, 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 Have you- <laughs> I like Cosmic Encounter... <laughs> A lot. And I think it actually fits really well in this idea of like the cartoony, like almost close to sci-fi parody. But Anachrony is like so close and dear to like what I want from a board game that I, I can't help nope. but say fire away Anachrony. Anachrony fire away. Serial confluence is f- <laughs> <name. laughs> That's what I have to say to you. All right. Uh, in one corner, I bring you Cosmic Encounter. In the other corner, Neelan brings you Eclipse. We just got done fighting about Cosmic Encounter. Mark, what do I have to do to sway you here, dude? Cosmic Encounter, look at the cover. There's aliens all over this I think there's more aliens on the Eclipse cover. No, we're going to push Race for the Galaxy up, right? Yeah, we're going to push Race for the Galaxy up, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you're you're on my side. You got got aliens, you got weird aliens. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll go Cosmic You like weird aliens? Let me show you the Eclipse cover. How dare you? Oh, my God. The spreadsheet Eclipse cover? Mark brings us Beyond the Sun, and I bring back Quantum. All right, Neelan, let's be real here. Beyond the Sun says it's about tech trees, and yet the entire board is white as hell. There's white everywhere. There's no color on this board. The techs barely do anything. They're like literally plus one, minus one, plus two, plus three. That's not technology. Are you kidding me? I've got unique spaceships in Quantum. And plus, I've got translucent dots. (laughs) We have we have set that present. Oh, You're man. right. I have to if, see that. If point. I had known that Kellen was seeding games exclusively to translucent components, then <laughs> I would have brought my A game. No, uh, look, I actually I'm with Kellen on this. I think that the text and the powers are the parts of the core of what makes Quantum interesting. Without that, it's a pretty deterministic game. And they're splashy in Quantum. As much as I like that the premise of Beyond the Sun is just about tech trees, I do agree that they're more incremental in nature. They don't feel that exciting so i think this is quantum for me fire away beyond the sun is a great game and you can actually get it which you cannot do with quantum but that doesn't matter because he has fired away (laughs) quantum fire away uh we keep marks beyond the sun and we bring in the warhammer 40k heavyweight forbidden stars forbidden stars could be a war i hate to do it yeah i hate to be voting against 40k here but it's did we describe the activation system (laughs) (laughs) Uh, this is Beyond the Sun for the aforementioned the sun tech uh, dreams. All right. Forbidden Stars and Imperial 2030. Okay. All right. This is- Mark, do not give it to Forbidden Stars. This is a war game. This is a war <laughs> game. 2030, Imperial 2030, fire away. It's 40K versus 2030. Yeah. Oh, is that what the yeah, 40K Yeah, it's the, literally for? the yeah. year 40,000. Oh, I thought it was like under the sea. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, I mean... This is like... Think about the cynicism. <sighs> Look, okay, this is a negotiation chip, because this is like between picking like, I don't know, even though I like broccoli, like broccoli and celery. This is like... Blah, prime way. rib and weird brother of prime rib. <laughs> so uh, what do you want me to vote for? 
Imperial 2030. Okay, this is a bargaining chip. All right. Be, okay, so I'll go for it. Chip. Far away. All right, fire away, Imperial 2030. All right, in one corner we have Dune. In the other corner we have Space Alert. Now, I want to hear, and Mark, the alien voices were cute, but what I actually wanted to hear was, could that fighting, could that spicy communication, does it have to be about a spaceship? You know what I mean? Could we be on like a ye old treasure ship and, you know, with Blackbeard? I mean, yeah, you, it could be like a Captain Sonar situation. Certainly. I mean, I'm not going to say that it couldn't be. It could be about like pirate ships coming in. But I think the theme is done well. I think the even the fact that you've got a CD and what says sci-fi more than a CD <laughs> that plays the sound effects and stuff just really adds to the ambiance of the sci-fi thing. Yeah. But no, yeah, it, it could be recent. It, it does also, I, I think it works. It does lead into it in some fun way, th- ways. Like there are times where your communication cuts out and you just hear like static, like over oh, right. the soundtrack and like you can't talk during those periods. It does have some fun things uh, with kind no. of the, 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 the sci-fi theme. Neilan smiling too much. <laughs> I picked Dune Fire away. Oh, this is tough. Uh, Space Lure was very close to being on my submission i think it's gonna be space alert for me oh my god space alert far away generic space alert. but it's He's kind of like the parody of, of sci-fi all right it's here thing. we go dune in one quarter and saul last days of the star in the other here is the argument mark saul is annoying <laughs> when people bring it up because they constantly bring it up most underrated game blah 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 the best game no one's ever heard of blah 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 you know, oh my God, it evokes such a unique theme over Dune. Mark, how did that, did I sway you? I mean, it's, the, oh God, it's just not sci-fi enough for me. It's just Dune or Saul? Dune. Dune? I mean, what? I guess, look, yeah, it has the, the, the space opera thing. I get it. Have you, do you know who Baron Harkonnen is? <laughs> do you know Duke Leto Atreides? The Benny Gesserit? Well, they're more like witches, so that's a little <laughs> the poor argument. I'm gonna go Saul far the, away. The Fremen Neelan. Be real. I, I mean I'm not voting against we, Saul in this. Like I I'm with Mark. Like I think it, it it feels more like sci fi to me. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm lying. not lying. That's fine. You can prefer your game. I get it. We've fired away. We'll move on. Netrunner in one corner and sidereal confluence in the other. All right, argue <laughs> where you're out of this one, Neelan. I still think that sidereal confluence represents like an ideal of sci-fi that I would like to see rewarded here. I think that you voted against Cosmic Encounter, and I think Cosmic Encounter and sidereal confluence are very similar in how they evoke science fiction. It's this weird, alien-y, annoying backstory with artwork that I don't like, that I don't want, that's sort of like the metaverse of aliens everywhere, lol, ha ha ha, Android Network on our fire away. I think if it was a choice for me, it would be Sidereal Confluence, so it's down to Mark. I'm going to go Sidereal. Fire away. Yeah, it's okay. Netrunner in one corner, Gaia Project. Uh, my choice between the two would be Netrunner. Yeah, Netrunner, Fire Away. Gaia Project versus Race for the Galaxy. Okay. Race for the Galaxy, Fire Away. Yeah, I just want to do a little bit of voting or a little bit of helping because I thought Mark you did a bad job. So there's a little bit in Race for the Galaxy of planets producing, and like the theme actually does help you understand the flow of the game, which is that planets produce, you can sell these type of goods for more or less resources. The artwork, to me, evokes bad science fiction novel covers that I do have a fondness and a memory of reading in the you know, early and late 90s. I don't think it's like deeply thematic, but I think I look at it and it feels like science fiction in this weird classic way that science fiction does. I also have never looked at Gaia Project, so fire away, race for the galaxy. I did like your argument about like the symbolism, even evoking like a a science fiction sort of thing there too. It's weird. Like yeah. Windfall yeah. And, and the outer glow and the inner glow. Like there's yeah. just, once you get it, you get it. And it still feels like weird. It's a little bit of that quantum effect for me where like it's science fiction by way of just being odd. Yeah, sure. Which is cool. All right. Next up, we have quantum in one corner and anachrony in the other. All right. So this is going to be a Neelan convincing. I actually candidly don't think quantum is my favorite game on the list i think you actually both probably like quantum better than me i do not think there is a better science fiction game on the list i think it should be number one by virtue of it being both that sort of plotting determinism with fact-based fighting which is not really what determinism is but that's what it feels like to me 
plus these crazy weird powers that just break all those rules, plus a board presence that feels stark and spacey. I think Quantum is the perfect thing here. Anachrony time traveling mech robots that could feature anime. That's what Mark said. You know, that's a lot of science fiction, but I don't think it tops Quantum for me. It'd be hard for me to argue against Quantum in any pairing. Mind clash, Neilan. Here's the thing, Kellen. I think that as much as I like Quantum and I, I and Quantum's going to go far in this list, it's the same argument that you guys had against Eclipse. It's like it's a specific type of sci-fi that is overrepresented. Anachrony feels more wholly unique to me while being unquestionably sci-fi as f- like. But it's also just a Euro game. I. It's also just a bad Euro. Uh, no, it's like, not it's a bad Euro like game. A, a it's not. It's not a medi- It's an excellent. It's it's an excellent Ugh. game. I think it's an excellent game, and I think it's one that evokes its theme really, really, really well, which is more than you can say for ninety percent of Euro games. I'm not if I win. Minded. Quantum on the left, Cosmic Encounter on the right. I think this will be all three for Cosmic Encounter because these people don't understand Cosmic Encounter. Am I wrong? <laughs> yes. I phrased that in a way so that you had to say that I was wrong, not wrong. Uh, I think this is quantum for me. Yep. I pick quantum. It doesn't matter. Fire away. Cosmic encounter and beyond the sun. I'm going to go beyond the sun just because I think it's more evocative of sci-fi of like hard sci-fi and it's got the tech trees and it's like, that's what the game's all about. So I'm going to go beyond the sun. Yeah. Fire away. I, I'm with you on by, beyond the sun. Like the science as the core mechanic is cool as hell to me. Fire away. Beyond the Sun or Eclipse. Okay. Hear me out with Eclipse. Like everything we've been talking about with tech, all of that, that exists in Eclipse. You're picking up cool technologies. You're going to be the guy that's going to be like, I want lasers. And you're going to take that. You're going to be the lasers guy. Make your lasers ships. And that's cool and that's fun and that's splashy. As much as I like Beyond the Sun's tech trees, you're going to get the next tech in Beyond the Sun and be like, I, I can colonize for three resources instead of four resources now. Kellen, yeah, I think it's it's got to be Eclipse. Eclipse has missiles. I know, I know that's true. Eclipse, and I know, and I know we will get this. Why wasn't Twilight Imperium in this list? Because we chose good games for the list. Eclipse, fire away. Uh, all right, Sidereal Confluence on the left, Space Alert on the right. I really want to try Space Alert, and I am biased against Sidereal Confluence. Space I alert, I do way. think that Neelan has no leg to stand on with Sidereal Confluence if he says that Cosmic Encounter is not. I, I actually think they're I, literally like. I, almost I mean, one I, I for don't one. agree with you in premise. I, I think it's like it's the cartoony nature of cosmic that throws me a little bit. Like it, with sidereal confidence, I'm imagining Star Trek. With cosmic encounter, I'm imagining Galaxy Quest, and like that's like this disconnect for me. I could show you the art from sidereal confidence, and then question everything you've ever said on the podcast. Uh, space alert! Fire away! Space alert! Fire away! Studio Confluence versus Saul, Last Days of a Star. That's tough. Saul, fire away. I'm going to say Sidereal Confluence, fire away. I'm going to say Sidereal Confluence because I just don't want Saul to win. Saul, Last Days of a Star versus Android Netrunner. Saul, fire away. Saul, fire away. All right. It doesn't matter what I think. This is what you guys do to me all the time. Android Netrunner on the left, Dune on the right. It's got to be Dune. Dune. I agree with you that. We're all Dune something's happening android netrunner on the left nemesis on the right this again i do agree nemesis does a pretty good job of feeling like that alien but it's because it has 300 dollars worth of plastic aliens in the box that's fair and do i want to reward that i i don't know i like yeah it's probably for me the worst game on the list but i think it's very very evocative sci-fi yep i will vote nemesis fire away nemesis fire away space alert versus anachrony anachrony i'll go space alert i'm happy to vote anachrony all right it's done space alert versus quantum quantum Quantum. fire away space alert versus cosmic encounter i just love that like cosmic encounter has become not a sci-fi game (laughs) no i I don't even think that's true this one's interesting for me because like this is like the two sci-fi parodies like almost like yes that's true i go space alert fire away i go cosmic encounter fire i think i go cosmic on this one cool Space Alert versus Eclipse. I go Eclipse. Fire away. Eclipse. Fire away. Space Alert versus Beyond the Sun. I'll go Space Alert on this. Beyond the Sun. Beyond the Sun. Fire away. I just wanted to vote for it. Imperial 2030 versus Space Alert. Okay, guys. Let's be reasonable. (sighs) One of these games is set nine years from now, and one of these games is in space. (laughs) 
Do you know what happened in 2021? Because multiple tech company owners went to space, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> what gets more cynical than that? That's Who knows true. where Jeffrey Bezos will go in 2030? Imperial 2030, fire away. Space <laughs> alert, fire away. <laughs> After that, Neilan? <laughs> Imperial 2030 versus Sidereal Confluence. All right, I can't. Sidereal Confluence. Let's move on. I already know what you're voting. Imperial 2030 or Saul, Last Days of the Star. Mark and Neelan have locked in Saul, Last Days of the Star using only their eyes. <laughs> uh, Imperial 2030 versus Dune. Dune, Dune. fire away. Dune. Great, great. Because of those Benny Gesserit witches. Nemesis versus Imperial 2030. I guess Nemesis. I do think Imperial is a good... Yeah, I, I would give Imperial 2030 this one. I find it hard to reward Nemesis's like, yeah. generic use of another p- license. All right, Imperial, we're doing it. <laughs> Nemesis versus Forbidden Stars. Nemesis. Forbidden Stars. Forbidden Stars. Love it. All right, we have a list. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Number 15 is Gaia Project. Number 14. Wow, Mark. One of the best board games of all time. Race for the Galaxy has been done dirty in the competition. Number 13, Android Netrunner. How did this happen? I voted for Netrunner a (laughs) bunch. Number 12, Alien slash Nemesis slash the game that Mark lost on the first turn. And yet somehow it's one of the top rated board games of all time. Number 11, Forbidden Stars that is coming back to us, but you cannot buy now. Number 10, a game set only Nine years from today, Imperial 2030. Number nine, the science fiction that Mark believes is fantasy, Dune. Number eight, the game that stole everything it could from Danny Boyle's fantastic film, Sunshine Saul, Last Days of a Star. Number seven, Sidereal Confluence, trading and negotiating in the Elysian Quadrant. The only thing that Neelan had to do to get this higher was read the full title, which he never, never did. (laughs) Coming in at seven, number six, the real-time game Space Alert that you get to shout at your friends in cooperation. Number five, the latest tech tree wonder in white beyond the sun. Number four, Eclipse, second dawn for the new galaxy, except we haven't tried that one yet. Number three, what? Number three, Cosmic Encounter? How did that even happen? How did this... This Are you reading it backwards? You were clicking what you wanted, not what we said. <laughs> I'm definitely not reading it backwards because Gaia Project is not number one. Number three, somehow Pub Meeple knew you two were idiots. Cosmic Encounter. Number two, Quantum, the game that deserved number one. And number one, the game that Mark says has anime in it. <laughs> Anachrony, a time travel worker placement tour de force from Mind Clash? And that is going to do it for this episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast. You heard it here. You heard all about the science-based fiction, board games, sci-fi, sci-fi. Get your sci-fi. Thank you and good night. Oh, no, I have to say thank you to everyone else. Thank you, as always, to Heart Society Music for their song, What's on Your Mind, Kid, from their album, Wake the Queens. You can find us on all forms of social media. You can tell us we are wrong. You can tell us why Twilight Imperium 4th Edition is good or why the 3rd Edition is better. You can reach out to us on Discord at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord. Tell us about your favorite science fiction games. I would love to have a few more science fiction games. You can join our Facebook group at boardgamebarrage.com slash Facebook, where we recently crossed the 1,000 member mark. There are 1,000 of us on Facebook talking about board games. You can email us at boardgamebarrage at gmail.com, and you can leave us a review. Wouldn't that be grand? Thank you, and good night. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Phase four, Mark, help me here. Um, is phase four when you when you buy the goals, right? Isn't that when you get the goals? Yes, is, great. Is that right? You. Yeah, okay. I am absolutely floored, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say, this is honest appreciation that you can remember a game that has five phases as unthematic <laughs> as Riverboat, and you remember phase four of five from six months ago off the top <laughs> the, of the your head. The theme helps. The theme helps. Yeah, it really. Helps. I absolutely. bow to you, Mark. Absolutely. So in phase four, you're drafting. One, yeah, they had the sweet. Miss him, miss him, miss him, name this. This is all. I'm a hostile of my big city, because it's so easy.